Council work session. The first um, item is committee reports and items of interest, and we do have an opportunity here directly from the police auditor, but if anyone else has things they wish to share first, yep, Greg, go for it. Okay, so last week I was in uh, Washington, D.C. for the National League of Cities uh, Housing Task Force and the beginning of those talks. Um, there's 18 of us in the room, and we are... Um, talking about uh, housing supply, land supply, um, the difference between um, income and the cost of housing. Um, and we're starting to talk about uh, uh, some specific strategies. We're trying to narrow things down into a five or six item bucket uh, to be able to affect uh, federal uh, po housing policy. Um, so when we meet again uh, via phone uh, this month, we're gonna start really kind of narrowing down what our um, focus is gonna be on. Uh, homelessness was another uh, topic that is uh, big on everybody's agenda. Um, we, are, we are not alone, I can tell you that, um, for that uh, regard, and then, um, uh, the uh, League of Oregon Cities had City Day in Salem on Thursday, and uh, I met with the governor. Um, we also uh, heard from the speaker, uh, the Senate president, the, uh, the minority leader in both houses, um, and uh, legislative session is ready to get off and going. So, um, you know, we're... We're, we're focusing on the issues that we, we're uh, on top of our list, which again is uh, housing, um, you know, uh, uh, tax reform, uh, property tax reform, which doesn't seem to be on the agenda of the legislature right now, but hopefully that'll pop up on their radar screen because it's something that is important for all cities. Um, and, uh, I say housing, um, tax, tax reform, um, and local preemption, and specifically around uh, some of the proposals that are beginning to emerge from the legislature right now. So okay. that's that's my story, and I'm sticking to it, Mayor. Well, thank you for all of that, all the <coughs> travel and, and uh, networking. So, uh, Jennifer. Thank you. I had a couple of committee reports. Um, Metropolitan Wastewater Management, as you guys probably know, they own a poplar tree farm. They took uh, some of that poplar and it was milled locally at Urban Lumber and then Ninewood, which is another local company, created lighti lighting grills. And they were just installed. They're in the Springfield Public Library meeting room. So if you're ever over at the library, you should go in there and check them out. They're really cool. They kind of look like this. Only their each individual lighting cover has, it's hard to explain, but they're really cool. And it was all done locally by um, the trees that were also grown locally. So they're pretty cool. Um, they're also going to be uh, having a community survey coming out in the fall. And I'll let everyone know when that happens so folks can log in and do that. Um, the Envision Eugene Technical Advisory Committee. Uh, easier, e more easily known as ETAC. Um, our next meeting is on February 7th, 5.30 at the third floor atrium meeting room, and we are discussing urban reserves, so if that's something that interests folks, they should stop by. And then I wanted to let people know that the next com uh, police commission meeting is being moved because it falls on Valentine's Day, so don't come on Valentine's Day. Come on the 12th, February 12th, Tuesday, same time, 5.30 at the EPD headquarters um, and country club road that's great thank you anybody else need a moment okay yes Betty some things consist people have been talking to me about a lot of people about 5g uh, you've all heard of that and I hope we will learn more about that when we meet with eweb soon um, people are very concerned about Willamette repaving about they think we should be doing undergrounding the utilities at the same time and I know that costs a lot of money, but I think it would be a better use of money than the quiet zone, actually. But it's, it, it does make sense to do it while you're doing the paving. And uh, I, not everybody, but a lot of people are unhappy with what's happened, happened to East Amazon Drive. 
because uh, people who live there have lost their parking. Parking is a big thing. Um, and Amen, and it, the, it's so narrow that it's people, some people say it's hard for them to turn out from their streets onto East Amazon now that there's the two-way bike lane, which has taken up a lot of the street. And, and they ask me if it's reversible, and I don't know. And I don't know whether it should be, and I don't know whether it can be. But it is hard on people. Those are modest houses along there, and they, they aren't well-to-do people. And they now don't have a place to park their second car or a place for guests to park. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I think we are ready uh, to hear uh, just an opportunity to get a briefing from a uh, police auditor on the next steps in the process of uh, reviewing an officer-involved shooting. So thank you very much. Good evening. I was told five minutes, but if you have questions, you might have a little bit more time, so I'm not sure. <coughs> Better place to be on my birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday! Happy birthday. Yeah. I could go first, but no, I didn't. Uh, we can. So, uh, we we know on uh, obviously on January 11th uh, there was an officer-involved shooting at, at Cascades um, Middle School. Um, certainly want to offer condolences to everyone involved. I know it's been a very tough um, situation. I was uh, out of town at the time, so um, Leah did the heavy lifting um, on on uh, responding to the scene as we we're um, required to do on critical incidents and um, got her snapshots in her mind about what happened. So what happens on our, as you have in your handouts, um, if you want to flip the next thing, is, uh, and I know um, because these are rare, thankfully, uh, sometimes people forget how the process works, so we want to make sure people understand the process. What, ha what, has, ha what has occurred is the district attorney has completed a criminal investigation um, based on what was provided to her by the interagency deadly force investigation team, uh, which is um, detectives and officers from several agencies within um, Lane County, and usually directed by someone from the... Um, uh, Oregon State Patrol. Uh, they, she receives that investigation and she issues a ruling about whether or not uh, the officers committed any crimes. It was a criminal investigation. Um, at the conclusion of her report, uh, and she does have the option of taking it to the grand jury, she did not take it to the grand jury. She um, got the report and made the decision um, that it was, there was no criminal violations. From that point, um, the file is given to internal investigations. I don't think they have it yet. I'm, I'm certain it's voluminous. And then they conduct an administrative investigation to determine whether the officers committed any Eugene Police Department policy violations. And we monitor that investigation. Historically, we've done, um, Internal Affairs has done little additional investigation because all that information is, uh, was um, compiled by IDFET. Um, at times we've interviewed the officers, but that's been about the extent because we don't have the uh, authority to do, to redo forensics investigations, those kinds of things. So when they get that file and we monitor and then we decide um, that next step after that investigation is completed, the chief of police <coughs> creates what's called a use of force review board. Um, for the purpose of determining whether or not the actions of the employees were consistent with department policies. The use of force review board consists of the supervisor of the officers, typically the training lieutenant or, or sergeant, um, and um, an, another, uh, the, uh, what other sergeant? Um, Defensive tactics sergeant, and um, uh, at least one other lieutenant. Uh, we're also involved on that board as non-voting members, and then um, in addition to that, the chief may have someone from the outside. So, for example, in the in the shooting of um, um, 
uh, Mr. Babb, there was a um, PTSD expert who was also uh, a panelist in that um, particular use of force review board. Within 30 days after the determination by the board as to whether policies were followed, the use of force review board chairperson then completes a report and recommendations. We, uh, in the past, have at um, at these review boards have offered our input as well. Uh, we are not, even though we don't vote, we're not certainly not silent members. Um, for those that know me, um, they know that I have had a lot of experience in uh, investigating officer-involved shootings. Lee has had several cases now as well, so we do have the experience to be participants in those boards. Um, the chief then makes the final determination regarding compliance with policy, training, issues, and tactics. We also may provide recommendations to the chief. The Civilian Review Board can have um, two roles. They may choose to review the completed case file at a regularly scheduled meeting. Uh, they've done that in the past on 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 their um, on the, at their meetings. Excuse me. Uh, they review the quality of the investigation within EPD, quality of the work of the auditor's office within again the confines of the administrative investigation, training or policy recommendations, and the final adjudication decisions whether the officers have violated EPD policies. It's not within the scope of the ordinance for them to make comments about the um, interdepartmental uh, investigation. Uh, it doesn't restrict them, but that's not typically uh, or that's not within the respons their responsibilities within the ordinance. Um, so, um, again, they can make comments about it, but that's a different lane that they can go down if they wish to. Uh, one of the things that came out during this investigation, uh, at least by representatives of the family, was the potential for a community impact case. And so I wanted to explain that briefly as well. Um, they are investigations involving sworn police personnel that alleges excessive force, bias, disparate treatment of violation or violation of constitutional rights, which the auditor determined shall be reviewed by the Civilian Review Board as a community impact case. If that is the path taken, and again, I haven't seen the file yet, um, if selected by the auditor, uh, the Civilian Review Board will review a summary of the complaint and investigation and may decide whether they will accept it as a community impact case by majority vote. So I would have to make the recommendation they would vote on it. If so, chief employees and complaints are notified. Again, during the investigation process, we monitor and review the investigation. The shift is then if it's not a community impact case, the issue, the chief issues a final adjudication and the review board reviews the closed investigation. If it's a community impact case, upon completion of the investigation and preliminary adjudication decision by the chief, the auditor will provide the investigation to the civilian review board for review. Within 14 days of receiving the case, the review board will meet to discuss and present its determinations on the case, including whether they agree with the chief's preliminary adjudication decision. Uh, within, and then within 30 days, the review board will do one or more of the following. They can concur with the EPD adjudication, develop recommendations on handling of the complaint and investigation and or identify policy or procedural issues. Again, because this was an IDFID investigation and not an EPD investigation, there are limitations to that. Or it can require the city to reopen the administrative investigation if it finds either the investigation was incomplete or inadequate and the CRB has reasonable belief to believe that additional investigation is likely to reveal facts that could affect the case outcome or the adjudication reach is not supported by substantial evidence. If the board voted to reopen a community impact case, the auditor shall inform the CRB of the subsequent investigation conducted and the final adjudication decision. Now loop back again to what I said earlier in terms of whether the investigation was incomplete or inadequate 
That was an IDFID investigation. So there's very limited participation by the Eugene Police Department in this type of investigation. And therefore, the input of the Civilian Review Board within the authority would be very limited, although it's certainly not restricted by um, any comments that they might have. So in essence, the community impact, a typical community impact case has more civilian review board review of the investigation prior to the chief's final decision and also then can make recommendations to the chief prior to his final decisions. So um, that's sort of a brief overview of it. Um, and um, so that's where we are in terms of decision making. As I said, we haven't got the case file yet. I, I assume it'll be a few more weeks before we get to see the case file. And um, since Leah went to the scene and did most of the heavy lifting, she'll be on the um, Use of Force Review Board. Um, she served on that several times on some other cases that we've had. So uh, I'm, I'm not concerned about her ability to serve in that capacity. She does it very well. So does anybody have any questions? I went kind of fast, but. Questions? Questions? <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Um, what do you look for when you decide whether something's a community impact case? I mean, bes it, besides the first sentence. <laughs> it, it's sort of, I, I suppose, and it's pretty rare, um, um, but in terms <clears throat> of just community impact, I think if there's, for example, a, a demonstration in which there's um, a lot of, um, interaction, uh, both physical and verbal, for, for with police, for example, and it's an important issue, in other words, something that doesn't go well under those circumstances. Um, as it says, uh, excessive force um, uh, that, that seems egregious at the time or um, disparate treatment. Um, Tim Lowey, who used to be the chair of our review board, used to say, you know it when you see it. Mm -hmm. And, and I, really, that's about the best explanation I can get because I can't predict future behavior by the police or any interactions they might have with the community. Thanks. Alan, I know you're calling in. Do you have any questions? Probably not. I, I, I have a question that's a No, I don't, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, go ahead, Mike. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> we had a community, we've had, I think, since the ordinance, two or three community One. impact? One. So that was the in it was the the tasing downtown. Yes. Um, I thought the Chinese student that was no. Huh. Okay. In both those instances, though, those were questions of uh, use of a taser rather than deadly force. Um, and one of them, as mentioned, was. <clears throat> would you? I don't know how to ask this question. It seems to me that this almost rises to that level. It's not obvious. It's not my determination to make. Um, do you have any preliminary thoughts on that? That's how I see the file. Um, uh, again, this is this was not an in-house investigation. It wasn't what I'm sorry. It was not an in-house investigation. Right. It was an external investigation in which EPD had one person inserted to sort of oversee things right um, so in terms of the oversight of the investigation itself um, from they would have limited authority over that they're certainly entitled to opinions about it how the other agencies might have done an investigation but um, it's not part of their um, defined responsibilities per ordinance mm -hmm. I'm I'm not an expert in this sort of work at all. Um, but it seems to me that the clearer, and that's that's a loaded way to say that, but the clearer the body cam video, for example, of, a, of any particular instance, um, the less likely that there could be um, questions about facts of, of an incident. Um, do you think that having um, body cam Worn now by officers leads to more or less community impact type cases. Do you think this is more or less likely to be one based on the video? 
Um, I know that um, the body worn cameras have been extraordinarily helpful in making decisions for us. Um, uh, taken, they take more time when we get someone filing a complaint because I feel an obligation to not push forward an investigation until I've watched the film yeah. um, and put employees in a situation where they're being investigated even though there's film that determines whether or not they should be. On the other hand, at times we've also found things in because of body-worn cameras in which that has led to an investigation. So they've been very helpful. Um, would they more cause more or fewer community impact cases? Um, it seems to me, if I could just interrupt, that community impact designating a case such um, is designed in order for us to take a to take a, mi a magnifying glass to it because it has such relevance to large numbers of people in the community to, to amplify and clarify the, the results. But it seems to me that video seems to do that too. When we did, you, you, um, they'll see a more complete video because there's some um, extraordinarily graphic parts uh -huh. um, that didn't make uh, the editing. Uh, the other choice that the review board can have um, is they may also, per, uh, in, per the ordinance, the civilian review board may provide a forum to gather community concerns about incident-specific police actions and may receive and forward complaint information to the auditor's office for processing. I, I can't even remember, quite honestly, when they uh, passed that um, Bill in the Oregon legislature, if that occurred before or after the after um, council had established the community impact case, uh, I know I have it in my paperwork here somewhere. Um, so those are those two options. But when we, uh, I think, envisioned a community impact case, it was a case in which uh, Eugene Police Department did the entire investigation and was. Uh, uh, not only part of the incident, but did the entire investigation. I see. So I, I wish I know knew exactly when. I know it's in the stack somewhere. My memory, and I could be wrong. The Senate bill was passed in 2007, and I believe the original version of the ordinance was 2007. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Sounds so good. that and that that makes sense. So. The design by city council uh, with recommendations from the police commission might have been somewhat different on the community impact case um, by the same token, how it fit ended up being designed because there's uh, each county has some leeway in how um, they uh, can design their um, use of deadly force processes. So um, uh, for example, Deschutes County is different than how Lane County is. So mm -hmm. I have the revised edition. Okay, January 2nd, 2007, um, approved by the Planning Authority. So actually the legislation was probably before that. Um, but in any case, um, it was probably almost on the same time frame as the council ordinance for the auditor's office and the review board and community impact cases. Thank you very much. Alan, you have a question? Yeah, thank you for the presentation, Mark. Um, it's been a lot of comment in the community about the speed at which this all this information came out. Um, and I know these things take time. And uh, I wonder if you could comment on that and, and whether or not it, it was disproportionately long or. Uh, I thought it was, um, I thought their pace it was a good pace, I thought, because there are certain um, uh, lab requirements and forensic requirements and ballistic requirements uh, that I think in the past haven't been done fully. Um, so I know the community wants quick answers. Uh, ultimately, there's that decision about whether to release, for example, the body camera footage. I know some uh, uh, jurisdictions have a very short time frame. I know that we learned um, uh, our, our lessons in, in Cincinnati, in which it was probably a day or two where the footage would be released so that the community could understand. Uh, I also appreciate the district attorney's 
uh, uh, feelings uh, that, that she didn't want to release the video until all the witnesses were interviewed. And I think that that's a byproduct of how the IDFID is composed. Um, whereas in Cincinnati, where everything was investigated in-house by the homicide division, you usually got to talk to the witnesses within hours after the event occurred. Uh, um, here, you don't normally get to talk to the witnesses within hours after the uh, event occurred, so that stretches it out. So for me, quite honestly, the longer the medical examiner has the body and is doing their exams and the longer the lab and the ballistics is out, that leads me to believe and, and leads me to be hopeful that those things were done in a very thorough manner. But again, until I see the file, I won't be able to know for sure. Yeah, uh, specifically the body cam video, um, if it were released earlier, uh, there's, there were a lot of people that jumped to conclusions about this. Um, people came to city council and, and, and were saying things as if they were there uh, that were absolutely not true. Um, and if that process could be speeded up so that the video body cam video uh, could be, as you said, in some jurisdictions, a matter of days instead of you know, two weeks almost, mm -hmm. um, I think that would be very helpful in a lot of incidences, especially in this one it would have been. In, in Cincinnati, we started doing it the next morning after we had the type of unrest that we had as a result of that. I know Chicago... Boy, I want to say six days. Um, some jurisdictions under consent decrees are very short time frame um, in which there's turnover for that. But again, their processes are different in terms of how and when they can talk to witnesses and things like that. So, um. so if we wanted to pursue that and, and uh, have that come out a little earlier, how would we go about doing that? I know it's a <coughs> agency. Um, investigation and the district attorney, none of which are in the city of Eugene, so we don't have control over a lot of this. Um, any ideas? The district attorney has control over all of this while it's a criminal investigation. So that's the, the uh, point of leverage with the district attorney. They, she decides what happens when. Uh, yes, until she's completed her the criminal investigation and she's made a decision. She, it's, she's in charge. Okay, thank you very much. Everyone had their questions answered. I really appreciate your coming and giving us briefing. I think it's helpful for us to hear and for the public to be able to hear. So thank you very much for that. My pleasure. My pleasure. And uh, thanks for your good work. And we'll, uh, you know, as soon as we get the file, and we'll, we'll get moving on it. And at any point in time, if you want updates or anything like that, we'll do the best we can. I'm sure Chief Skinner would be more than happy to do that as well. Um, um, he was certainly engaged in this as much as he could be engaged as well. So. Thank you very much. Here? Yes. Now, also, I will point out, we did have a, a, a report from the district attorney that was on email um, mm -hmm. that, I, that, that I, I read and reviewed this afternoon, and, you know, I'm pretty satisfied that that was a thorough uh, review of, this, of the incident. Okay, thank you. And we are now ready to move into a regular agenda. First item, uh, municipal court presiding judge. Have an additional handout if you could pass that around, please. So good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Carrie Beraldo. I'm the Interim Human Resources Director and here to provide support to you in the hiring process for the presiding judge. Um, this is a follow-up to the Council work session from January 9th in which you indicated an interest in hearing more about options for hiring the presiding judge as an employee, so I'm here to walk through those details. Um, as a reminder, current code requires that we fill this position as an independent contractor. So I have um, provided you with a possible code amendment that you could consider if you would like to go ahead and pursue an employee judge. I did want to note for you that the possible code amendment would not preclude you from still hiring that um, position as a contractor. It would just give you an option to hire either way. Okay. 
Um, if you do decide to fill this position as an employee, there are a couple ways in which we can do this, and so I'll walk through the details of both of those. Uh, the handouts that I gave you are an overview of what that process is. And then I also did include um, a letter that um, Wayne Allen had written and emailed out before his retirement that went out to you all um, in terms of his uh, recommendation on that. So I wanted to make sure that if you hadn't seen that, that you all had that. So um, one method for going about filling this position could be a direct appointment. Typically, those are used when an employee has been serving in an interim capacity. Um, the decision would be made based on a stra strong um, performance record. Um, the employee would have knowledge and expertise that would make them the strongest choice and there would be a likelihood that you would feel that they would be selected if there was a competitive process. So that is an option that you can use. Um, it still require, will require some of the same steps that I'll go through when I go through this chart. Um, however, it would be significantly faster because it wouldn't involve all of the steps. Um, the second way we could go about it is a full competitive recruitment process. And so I'll walk through um, some of those steps with you as well. Uh, I would note that a competitive recruitment process probably will take three to four months um, to get through um, all the way from job posting through hire. Uh, so first step would be finalizing a job description and salary. If we did go with an employee position, this is a brand new position to the city, so we would actually need to develop or finalize the job description. Um, I did provide a draft job, job description in your packets. Um, I would note that uh, before his retirement, um, Wayne Allen did provide a good amount of feedback and input on that job description, so I was very happy to have his input into that. Um, and then additionally, I did provide a, um, some preliminary information about salary. Um, that's not necessarily something that we have to talk about today, but I wanted to put that in front of you all so you could have a good um, sense of what that could look like. Um, I would note that even if we did a direct appoint or a competitive recruitment, finalizing that job description and salary would be needed um, for both of those processes. Um, if we proceed with a competitive process, the next step is to develop a job posting. Um, just want to speak about the difference to those. Some of you probably know this, but um, a job description is very detailed about the duties that somebody would do. A job posting is really what I would call like your advertising or your marketing, where you could really speak to um, the organization, the community, um, some of the initiatives that we work on, uh, folks that are within municipal court, some of the folks that they would get to work with. So it's really more of a brochure or an advertising piece. And so we would want to draft up that before we um, entered into the recruitment. Um, in addition, uh, you would want to likely may want to generate some supplemental questions. That's a good opportunity for you to have a firsthand look at their writing samples, and it's also used as an additional tool for screening throughout the process. Um, we would want to develop an advertising strategy. I know on the 9th, I think I had shared with you, and it is in the draft job description, that um, this position would require that the candidates be an active member uh, in good standing with the Oregon State Bar. So it's likely if we were looking at advertising, we're probably not looking at a large national recruitment. Um, it would probably be more focused, or advertising would be focused within Oregon. Um, and I'm happy to provide recommendations of different um, agencies that we could be posting through, and you'd be looking at professional associations that are affiliated with the court. Um, Lastly, we would, well, not lastly, there's a lot more steps. <laughs> um, we would want to finalize a recruitment process schedule. Um, and this details um, all the way through how long you would want to have the position posted for. Typically, for this level of position, you're looking at probably wanting to post it out for three to four weeks where you're taking in applications during that period of time. And then all the way through your interview process, your screening, all of that, so you kind of have that laid out. So we move on to the next section where we talk about screening. Um, so again, you'd have a posting period, you'd be collecting applications. The first step would be um, to have somebody review through those applications just to determine that someone has met the minimum qualifications. And again, that would be based on the job description that we have drafted. Um, additionally, uh, you would then likely want to include, or you could include, uh, subject matter experts to help you evaluate those applications. They would be doing some kind of rating um, on the application materials and supplemental questions if you did include those. And then top candidates are usually then identified for interview. So we jump down to the interview section. Uh, we would need to select interview panel members. Um, it's likely for this level of position, you could want to develop uh, several 
interview panels. This is where you could use, um, again, some subject, subject matter experts. You might want to use folks from the DA office, public safety, some of the former judges, um, municipal court staff, as well as you all being involved in that process. Um, we'd need to develop interview questions. Um, those oftentimes we will solicit out suggestions from our subject matter experts, as well as um, some of the folks that I just recently mentioned as well. Um, we would conduct interviews and then gather feedback from panel members. I do think um, this position, it would be a great opportunity to, to include in that interview process a tour of community court. So if we could align it around a, a day or time that would work where that the candidates could go into community court, that would be a good aspect to include. And um, just to mention that if you are wanting to go with a direct appoint, you could also conduct an interview for a direct appoint as well, as I know not all of you have had the opportunity to work with um, Judge Gill. So you could think about doing that before you wanted to decide what, if you wanted to go with a direct appoint option. Um, those three steps really encumber the major part of the three to four months. So oftentimes when people hear three to four months, that seems like a really long time. But when you think about posting for three to four weeks and then having all of those, that's really where the majority of the time comes in. Um, once you've got down and you have a final candidate, we would want to do references and a background check. There is a required background check um, specific to the criminal justice information system that's um, required for the municipal court judge. So we would need to do that. And those steps would also need to be completed for a direct appoint as well. And then lastly, finalize a job offer. That's the end goal. Um, so that's really quick, high level of what that process would look like. Um, and I think I'll turn it back over to the mayor as I'm really looking for direction on if you do um, want to pursue a code amendment and um, that would uh, provide you with the flexibility for how you would want to position. <clears throat> Okay, I have Mike already in the queue, Claire, anybody else ready? Uh, Chris, Alan, okay, take it away, Mike. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. How much would it cost, and thank you, by the way, for that presentation, how much would it cost in external hard, soft costs, internal employee time, roughly, more to do the extensive search you've just outlined mm -hmm. versus us appointing and hiring Judge Gill. How much money are we talking about? Um, ballpark money, I don't know if I could answer off the top of your head. Rough Normally guess. around hours that we would be putting into it. A, a staff, vote, staff would probably be committed to 40 to 80 hours of our time, um, but then it would also require um, the time of counsel. It would require the time of panel members, right, to be coming, coming for interviews, folks to screen. Um, so it could... It, it would be a significant cost. It wouldn't be as much as what you would do for John. Firm. Any idea what that would roughly cost? You know, I I think it's uh, you're talking. You know, it could be easily twenty or twenty five thousand dollars. And the reason why I say that is, is when we go out for a a recruitment and uh, have a, a firm that we hire. Oftentimes that can cost twenty dollars to $25,000. They do a lot of the wor same work. Our staff still does some work. So it's, uh, it could be in that mag. I wouldn't be surprised if, that's, if that, that magnitude isn't the difference. I asked that question because I spent some time talking with Judge Allen and meeting with Judge Gill myself, and I'm perfectly ready to hire him. This is just my personal opinion. Um, and save the taxpayers the money, personally, because I know what kind of extraordinary job he's done. Um, so I, I don't know how my colleagues feel, but that's how I feel. And I I don't, you know, know where we land. I'm happy to go with that. I, I like the system that we have, but I don't know that I feel all that strongly about the differences until I'm, you know, learn that there's some significant difference about having... Uh, the judge is an employee versus the contract basis. If I were to find that it would, is a significantly, you know, higher cost if it was, I, I don't know. Um, based on what I know at the moment, I don't see significant, anything about the difference that makes me feel strongly about it one way or another. Um, but uh, again, I, I think I'm ready to, to move on without an extensive hiring process personally. So thank you. Okay, Claire? Well, Mike and I agree. Awesome. Beautiful. 
Um, thank you, Mayor, uh, and thanks for the information and uh, packet. So, um, yeah, I guess I'll start with with uh, my opinion of Judge Gill. Um, so, I think um, I believe we should do a direct appoint of uh, Judge Gill uh, with an interview conducted by this body, so that everyone can have the benefit of learning from him why uh, he's uh, the best candidate. But I, I do believe right now our interim judge uh, will, even if we did a full bore recruitment and hiring process, I believe he is the best candidate for the job. So I actually had an opportunity to attend the community justice court conference in Birmingham with Judge Gill, and that's the Center for Court Innovation, which really fostered and created the community court system that's now uh, spreading across the country. And so I got to uh, interact with Judge Gill there and Judge uh, Allen uh, when he was still our uh, uh, chief judge at that conference. And, you know, as outlined in the letter that Judge Allen shared with us, uh, Judge Gill really has uh, a breadth of experience with our court. Um, he's taken on um, various uh, roles and responsibilities to improve the court, and I believe he is really dedicated to continuing the excellent work that Judge Allen started uh, there. So um, while it's possible we might find somebody else who warrants uh, due consideration, I really find it highly unlikely. Um, so I would urge us to consider the direct appoint process. Um, I'm inclined to uh, move us towards the um, having him be a council, having that position be a council employee rather than a contract employee. I, I just felt some awkwardness around the process with Judge Allen being an independent contractor, and I uh, think maybe it's more symbolic than anything else, but there is something about having that relationship of an actual council employee as our municipal court judge. And I also met with uh, Judge Gill recently and felt like one thing we could do, no matter who we hire into this position, is ask that person to come and give us more uh, frequent updates, maybe twice a year, yeah. mm -hmm. on the work of the muni municipal court beyond community court. There's a whole lot of stuff that that court is doing uh, that's really uh, important to our community and kind of hidden away. And so I think bringing that forward a little bit more about this important part of our city uh, is one of the reasons I like that idea of creating that as a council hired position rather than an independent contractor. Okay. All of it. Great. Chris? <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I put a lot of faith in Judge Allen. I think he's worked very hard over literally decades to create a system that works very well and has a very high regard. Um, I think his head is in the right place in terms of where justice can go and what it can do. So when he makes a recommendation around Judge Gill, um, I take it very seriously because he would not recommend somebody that he thought was going to break his system or not continue his system in the way that he feels it should be continued. And so I think that's a, that's a very important consideration. And on, and on his recommendation, I have also sat down with Judge Gill and had a chance to, to talk with him and kind of get a sense of where he thinks this might be going and what his goals are and where he might see uh, a court uh, system try to go in the future. And I was extremely impressed with not only the ideas he has, but the organization that he would try to pursue in order to get there. So I think he has the chops to do the job. And so I would, I would be fine with the direct appoint system. I don't know if we would necessarily find uh, a better candidate who understands our local uh, judicial needs as well as he does, who's been sitting in the bench and knows how this system works, all the parts of how this system works. With regard to the employment of the judge, um, I believe this, the original system was set up in the 70s? Yes. When the population of Eugene was like 70,000 people or 80,000 people. And I think when you have a relatively small community, and I'll use 70,000 advisedly, but a small community, then the idea of using contract employees for certain functions makes absolute sense. But we're now a city of close to 170,000 people, which I think really means we need to look at making those kinds of functions um, more robust, more dedicated, and more uh, secure in terms of their ability to operate. We did that with our city attorney system, and I think that has worked out great. 
never had to look back. I think that was a very smart idea. And I think we can do exactly the same thing with our municipal court presiding judge process. Um, so I would actually say of the, of the ideas before us, I would absolutely support um, creating the, the job of a permanent uh, employee presiding court judge who can then, you know, administer the rest of that system uh, the way he needs to administer it, similar to the way our auditor does or our city attorney does. Um, but I think having them be a city employee would help in a number of ways, not the least of which is the current contract specifies a certain work routine, a number of hours, which I know Judge Allen routinely violated, um, which technically is a violation, but he was doing it out of the goodness of his heart to do the best thing. I don't want to put a judge in that kind of position where they know what they need to do, but their contract constrains them. I'd like to just remove that constraint and let them be an employee to do the best job they can. Okay, Alan. Yeah, I too think that the uh, judge should be a council employee. And I think we should pursue that path. Um, I don't, uh, and I had a specific question about the job description. On page three, it says training and experience, the fourth um, segment, there's no bullets. Desired but not required is experience in community court. I'm wondering why that, I mean, that's a hallmark of what the judge does and a huge part of what we see as the, uh, the workings of our court. I'm wondering why that isn't a requirement uh, to be experienced in community court as opposed to just the way that it's done here. As just a desire. Yeah, right. I think that that's a good piece of feedback that we could look at. Yeah, I think that um, when uh, we had originally looked at this, we weren't sure if there were um, other areas that had worked in more of um, like a drug court, so not necessarily a community court, but a drug court could easily transfer over. Mm -hmm. And so we, we didn't want to limit ourselves on somebody who had maybe had that experience, but not necessarily a community court, if that makes sense. So we, we would still be looking for someone with that same set of problem solving skills in a court. Area, but that is a good piece of feedback. Yeah, well, in that case, then I'd say experience in community court or other similar types of courts. Yep, as required. As, I'd rather see that as a requirement as opposed to uh, desired but not required. Okay. Makes sense to me. Um, I don't know. I don't know Judge Gill. Um, I haven't met him, and uh, but I, so I necessarily lean towards an open recruitment, on part because it's just good public policy. It's more transparent. And I don't believe the cost should be a factor in this. If, if Judge Allen is any uh, uh, metric, this person might be here for, th how long was Judge Allen the judge? Like 20 something years, 27 years or something like that. So um, amortize that over years of service and it's, it doesn't make any difference. Um, on the other hand, Judge Allen's recommendation uh, is very important to me and weighs heavily on my mind. I, I'm, but I am leaning towards uh, wanting to do an open recruitment. And like you said, the requirements here are you you have to have um, Oregon experience, you have to have Oregon State Bar, and you have to have Oregon uh, 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 understanding of the, of the judicial codes and all the municipal codes. So it's going to necessarily be a limited pool. It's not necessarily going to be a, a, a nationwide search. It's really, for all practical purposes, really an Oregon search if we went out. And um, would, your, would you think this would garner a, a, a large pool of applicants or a, or a narrow pool of applicants? I think it could likely garner a smaller pool of applicants. I think um, when you look across, this, across Oregon, there's a mixed bag of folks that are either contract or employee um, judges. I think a good portion of them are contract um, judges. They work part-time. They like to set their hours. I don't know if we were posting it as an employee if they would be interested in coming on board for that. Um, but I do think the opportunity to come to Eugene and work in our community court could draw folks who are really interested in that specific type of work. Um, so I think it would be interesting to see what we would get. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, Emily. Thank you. So we could just decide to hire Judge Gill. We don't have to put it out like an RFP for buildings and stuff. Um, if we were going to direct a point, yes. If we if if we decide, if you all decided to go with a code amendment to make um, the position an employee position, then yes, we could just direct a point. After an interview. 
Yeah, you could interview and then direct a point. Or not. Right. <laughs> You would not need to send out an RFP right. for all of that. I, I, that's what I'm trying to clear up. So many things, you know, but to be fair, we have to ask, even if we yeah. already know what we want. And in this case, I already know what we want. So I want. I don't know what you want. Um, I met with Judge Gill for quite a while last week, and we talked about many things. Um, and I was incredibly impressed, both with his knowledge and his experience. But... Um, the love he has for this job, you know, this is what he wants to be doing. Um, and I think that he's doing a great job. I, there's just the excitement he has for it and all the experience. Of course, we should have an interview, but I'm, I'm really excited to hear that we could just decide to hire him and not have to go um, through a much larger process. And I'm not saying he's the only judge that would ever fit, but I'm, I'm really glad that he's here and, and I'd like to keep working with him. So I'm all for uh, bringing the judge in as an employee and uh, I'd love to hire Judge Gill. Thank you. Okay. Betty? Um, well, who, who appointed Judge Allen? Hmm. The council. Council? Forever? When? Yeah, Long I, ago? I, I, re I remember this. Ago. But is it, is it forever? It's been a long time, yeah. I would have to look back in my notes. I think it was 94. I don't remember deciding to reappoint at any point. I remember having an evaluation, but... We have. Mm -hmm. We renewed his contract. Yeah, so well, he was originally renewed. appointed in 1994, and then we, you all would have renewed his contract. But it's almost month. automatic that it goes on and on. And do we not need to open it for to let other people apply if we decide to appoint someone? Um, no, you would not need to with a direct appoint. We could just appoint someone. Um, and how long was the term? Um, well, with an employee, if you went with an employee, they would have a probationary period, and then after that they would be considered a regular employee. So other than if there was cause to terminate that employment relationship, then it's an ongoing employment relationship. And would we do what this? I would, what I'd also say is, uh, just like uh, myself and Mark and uh, the judge, all three of us work directly for the uh, council. So the council really at any time could choose whether or not you continue to employ us. And so that really is your call. So uh, <laughs> it seems that the majority want, I don't even know this judge, but. If the majority wants to appoint him, do we inter still interview him? Whatever we decide. I w it sounds like the majority of folks would want to do that. I think it's a good idea for you to interview, except ex especially for those of you who haven't had the chance to meet with him. I'm inclined to think if there are other people who would like the job that they should have the chance to apply. But that's, and have an interview, but I don't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take you back a ways. Um, I remember when Judge Allen got appointed because we had some significant issues with municipal court before he was appointed. And um, I was uh, an officer in the NAACP at the time. And um, uh, since Judge Allen was appointed, we haven't had those issues. So, um, you know, I strongly support... Um, you know, Judge Allen's recommendation uh, based on his record. I don't know Judge Gill, but, um, you know, I trust Judge, Judge Allen's, uh, you know, view on this. And I think that um, he should, you know, the municipal court should, judge should be an employee of the council. I have a couple of folks asking for a second round, but I just want to make sure I have this sequence clear. We actually have two decisions here. Mm -hmm. The first decision is whether we want to make a code amendment and have a salaried position as opposed to a contractor. And then the second decision would be, do we want to have a direct appoint? That's correct. Okay. Just wanting to be clear that we're clear. All right. So I have Mike and then clear for the second round. Thank you, Mayor. Counting around the table and knowing what I'd like to see happen, I move to direct the manager to have human resources come back to council with one, uh, and the and the 
city attorney to code language for the sake of, I, I got it, I know what I want to do, for the, the code language to make the city attorney an employee? City judge. judge. City, judge. city judge. Sorry, I looked right at her and said city attorney. <laughs> wow. Now I'm going to be working for you. <laughs> the code language necessary for review and public hearing to make the judge a, a council employee. And number two, to come back to us with an appropriate date for an interview with Judge Gill uh, to consider the possibility of direct appointment of him. Second. So can I ask a question and clarification? You have as attachment A in your packet um, language that would amend the code to um, provide the option of making the presiding judge a um, council employee. So then I, I then I'm alter my motion to bring that to a public that language that is in our AIS bring back for a public hearing. As soon as possible. Attachment A. Attachment A. Is is that acceptable to the second? Second accepts. Okay. And then to schedule as soon as is practical for our agenda, an interview with Judge Gill um, uh, with the thought towards direct appointment. Okay. Second. Any other questions? Clarification, Alan? Could those be sequential? Oh, sorry. So go through the process of, a, of modifying the code to make an employee, and then once that's complete, then you would have the interview. With, with Judge Gill to see if you want to do a direct point. Yeah, so he knows what he's doing, yeah. Correct. So yeah. he knows whether he's yes. what, what he's what he's <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so sorry, I skipped that over Claire. That's all right. So uh, yeah, so I think an interview is obviously important and, and I do actually think uh, an interview as a work session would provide uh, a great deal of transparency. Mm -hmm. The public would get to see Judge Gill uh, interact with the council and answer our questions uh, and we could solicit our constituents on questions they might want us to ask ask him. Uh, and I really think Emily's comment speaks to one of the strongest reasons that I support doing the direct appoint. Um, while it might be nice to do a full recruitment and have a bunch of people, you know, solicit us for this position, um, I just don't think um, they are going to be able to match the dedication that Judge Gill has shown already to this community and to this city. Uh, and other candidates will be lacking that by uh, just virtue of the experience and position he's been in and what he's done actually in that role. So, uh, and I frankly don't think we have an obligation to uh, provide other people with the opportunity to apply for the job. We have an excellent candidate who has demonstrated his uh, dedication to the community. I think we should interview him. If uh, we are not in agreement after that interview, that he's not the um, right, uh, possibly the, the best candidate, then we could reverse course and do a full recruitment. Mike, one more comment? Yeah, that last part was the reason I used the language that I did. If anybody has any concerns, it's easy enough after that work session to say, we appreciate getting to know you in that way. We want to open this up and get some more thoughts because by then, maybe someone in the community would say, well, our courts need to move in this direction instead. But I agree with the first part of what you said, that he's invested and has helped create some of the key parts of what are currently the admirable parts of our system. So no one's going to know them better, certainly, than he. And I'm happy with that. Okay. Are we ready for a vote? Oh, Betty? I'm in a minority, obviously. And it's not that I object to this person at all. I don't know that. But I don't think it's the right way to do it. I think there could be someone else who has been in the court who has different ideas. And I don't like hiring someone without giving other people a chance. Um, but I'm obviously in the minority here. I think someone else may, think, may have been around just as long and think, I think we should do something differently and would like to apply and wouldn't get the job, obviously. So I don't, I, I just don't like doing it this way. Okay, Alan? Just to clarify my vote, uh, um, I, I agree with Betty. I think that should be an open process. But um, at this point, an open process would probably be kind of a sham because everybody's the majority <laughs> of council has, has said that they, uh, they want to direct appoint Judge Gill. So um, I'm not going to stand in the way of that. 
Yes. And then just one other point of clarity. If you do go forward with a public hearing for the code amendment, the other thing that we would likely want to do prior to the interview is um, get agreement and finalize on the job description as well as the salary. So that could be something that I would either come back to. That was part of my motion. That in. Okay. Okay. To come back. <laughs> Great. Okay. Everybody ready? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Opposed? One. The process. Process. Appreciate that, manager. I just want to make sure clarify clarification. So we will uh, post that proposed ordinance for a public hearing. We'll move it to a public hearing. Uh, then we will schedule a work session where you have an oppor or an opportunity to take action on that particular ordinance, and then we would have the interview after those two things are already accomplished. So that's the sequence of events that will. And then the job description will play in there. Right into that. Okay. Yeah, play into that wherever the right place is. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yes, that's what we're all agreeing to. Thank you very much. Yeah. That was I like it. But excellent. Very helpful in moving us along. And uh, so our final order of business in this meeting: the parking update. I'll ask Jeff to come up to the table, and as he as he does, I just wanted to uh, just a couple of thoughts or comments uh, as we. Uh, go through this parking uh, in my 30 years is one of those things like weeds uh, that you're just um, there's always conversation around it and so um, put me down after her, gotcha. Gotcha. as you know we've put out uh, some changes via administrative order and as I mentioned to you recently that actually falls within the purview of the city manager it just does and so um, it it, the decision rests with me, but because this is a, uh, an important issue, we have had a lot of community input into that. It is appropriate for you to also provide your perspectives that we will then also consider as we before issuing a final order. And so uh, that's part of what we want to do. And uh, I can let Jeff uh, introduce the topic, and then we'd like to hear your thoughts. So. Good evening. I was trying to figure out what kind of weed I am. <laughs> so, would you like suggestions on yeah, that? Yeah. <laughs> we could do a naming convention here. So, uh, good evening. My name is Jeff Petrie. I'm the City of Jeans Parking Manager. And I was uh, reflecting back. Uh, I've been in the position for over 12 years. And I was looking at the Register Guard uh, picture of the great snowstorm of 69. And I was trying to figure out landmarks for downtown. I wasn't here in 69, but I couldn't figure out where things were. And I realized that was uh, in 69 when we started building the Overpark parking garage. The downtown business district built this garage. Jack was right on the right in that picture. Was it right there? Yeah, so I was trying to figure things. I was looking for the Citizens Building. I was looking for the U.S. Bank Building. I was looking for the Holt Center, LTD. <laughs> None of that was there. And so part of what I um, want to share quickly here then provide, uh, listen and provide, uh, hear your feedback. Uh, the City of Eugene's Municipal Parking Service is truly unique across the country. Uh, we're recognized for being innovative, community oriented, uh, and uh, progressive in how we do our parking. One of the things that really makes this unique is that the Municipal Parking Program, uh, you've charged me with managing the off-street parking system, which is the parking garages um, and service lots. You've also charged me with managing the on-street system, so campus, downtown, and across the entire city of Eugene, our officers rotate through. All that is accounted for in the Parking Enterprise Fund, which is unique across the country that everything is in that area. Many municipalities uh, house that in public works, they house it in the road fund, they house it in the general fund, and other area and police department. And the final thing that makes it unique is that we provide, we get no subsidies from the general fund or road fund or transportation fund. The parking fund actually transfers money back to the general fund for police services. So it's truly unique in how we have an opportunity here to manage with the community. And I know at some point someone asked me about Hatton Avenue and where we are in that neighborhood livability. Uh, so there's things that the uh, parking program is asked to do that uh, doesn't happen in every community. So I, I do appreciate the fun projects that we do. So we do have a rate increase here. Part of the um, proposal that we're seeking feedback on are rate increases to the off-street monthly permits, the off-street um, uh, daily parking, the off-street hourly, the on-street hourly, both downtown and campus. As we've walked through this uh, proposed admin order, we have uh, sent out thousands of postcards, thousands of emails. We have A-frames in every garage. 
uh, have the City of Eugene's first Reddit account as we engage with social media on Reddit about Eugene parking rates, both campus and downtown. It may not be the first, but um, it was a uh, different, different way to engage the community. Uh, we've also had feedback from uh, uh, downtown Eugene merchants, uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, Downtown Eugene Neighborhood Association and uh, Downtown Eugene Incorporated on this uh, proposed rate increase. So as we go through this feedback, um, uh, had about 125 written emails come back. Uh, I've done presentations, uh, the, reg the printed and the TV spots have generated more feedback. Um, so the question is, why are we doing this? And there's a couple of reasons why we're looking at this increase. Is one is this is a book that sits at my desk. It's $10 million of deferred maintenance in our parking structures. And we're working through that. Last year, we wanted to show value for the money that our customers are paying. And we retrofitted all the lights to LED lights. So there's some energy savings, uh, carbon emissions reductions, but also we found our customers want, or in a survey from last year, they want a safe, brightly lit, clean environment or downtown. And so that is identified in this, and we're working through that piece. Other pieces were a deep clean of the parking garages. Uh, the overpark was built in 1969, and we cleaned it for the first time a year or two ago. It was pretty dirty. Um, as we work through here, we've replaced concrete stairways and garages. If we don't replace those stairs, the entire garage shuts down and we can't use that garage. Going forward, our promise to our customers in this calendar year is uh, one of the biggest items is replacing the elevators. I'm sure no one here has received a complaint about the elevators not working in a parking garage. Uh, but there was a day that seven of our eight elevators were broken. And if all those elevators are broken, the garages don't function. And we are uh, personally driving customers up to the top of the garage, trying to meet our ADA requirements and just trying to meet downtown. We also have a couple other projects that are large uh, deck overlay projects. Think about replacing your roof and multiple levels of your house. Uh, those are in millions of dollars and that's far along overdue on this project. So those are some commitments that we're making. The other parts of the rate increase are going to continue funding for uh, police services. Uh, we transfer $838,000 each year uh, to, to the general fund for police services. We've also incorporated the on-street downtown meter rate increase of 15 cents funds the uh, downtown ambassadors. It's a one-for-one -one, um, funding mechanism right there. And then we also have a hosted bathroom in the overpark garage and day storage on the, what we call the 1060 olive lot. Um, these are all things that the parking fund is supporting. So I can go on and on about parking, uh, but part of the value that we have is we've adopted this uh, idea from Donald Shoup, a UCLA professor, who talks about if you have a paid system, uh, you pay for the cost of the program, you put the money back into the, uh, the infrastructure in the community. So, we have with capital projects about a seven and a half million dollar budget. We put a lot back into the community and we spent off about $60,000 to fund the mural program, uh, found, fund the Eugene Parade, small sponsorships, light up downtown and a few other smaller projects of that seven and a half million dollars. So here for questions. Great, thank you very much. I have already have two in the queue, Betty and then Mike and Claire. Okay. So you get rid of the two who Think who thinks there should be free parking at the all at once? Um, as you as you know, I, do, I think that on street parking should be free. That we should not be that we should tear out all the meters. Uh, I'm very concerned about the raise in rates, and I don't think when when any time we get told that there you can make comments on something, it's already been decided. I don't think there's a chance that it will be changed, but I do think it's wrong to raise the rates and I think it's wrong to charge for on-street parking. I, the places that have really healthy downtowns have free, to, free parking, like Corvallis and Salem, for example. And, and uh, there's no, no upkeep for the meters or, or costs for buying the meters or we I know you already bought them but um, I know that I it's all right to charge for or the over park I don't think it, the rate should be changed though I've had many comments and quite a few emails from people who say they really can't afford it they are people many of them work for senior and disabled services and 
many of them do not live in Eugene. So they can't just walk there or, or ride a bicycle to get to work. And they are not making that much money. So I think, I, I really believe that downtown belongs to the whole community and, and it doesn't just belong to the merchants downtown. It, um, we will, if you walk around downtown now, as I do now and then, you will find a lot of empty spaces already. And I think the more we expensive we make it to come downtown, the more likely people are to not come again. So that's one thing, that one bad effect. And the other bad effect is that the people who don't make much money will have to pay a bigger portion of their salary to park and something they can't afford. I don't think the parking fee should be supporting general services. We should... The things that are good, mm -hmm. that help everybody, should be paid for out of the general fund. We should find another way to to, to support that, rather than than on the backs of people who have to pay to park. Um, we're not going to cause people not to drive by charging them more. Some people, they there are places where people do not could not take buses. There are people places where people have really poor bus service, and they just can't sh shift to buses. And I'm very disappointed that we're raising the rates without, we say you could make a comment, but that doesn't do any good. So that's it, bye. That's it. Okay. Mike. Thank you, Mayor. Betty just said parking should be free. I agree with her to the general public, but let's be honest, parking's not free. That's nonsense, that's silly. Of course it's not. It costs money. Jeff's got a big book there. It says it costs $10 million. Okay? But to draw the nexus that that means we ought to charge the public regularly and on an increasing basis more money is not made because you have a big book any more than we should charge the public every time a police officer shows up. Yeah. That's a service that we provide as a city that we think is important for our citizens to benefit from and it serves larger goals, a safe community. We don't charge them every time the fire department shows up because we believe that having our homes not burned down and then not endanger our neighbors is a good thing that the city ought to pay for. I believe that parking, although it costs money, is a value that supports the other important goals we have around downtown. Now, I agree we ought to have free on-street parking because I think that supports the notion of people interacting with our downtown more intelligently, but m much more important than that. We shouldn't be making it harder on the people who have to have their cars downtown. We shouldn't be trying to create social goal realities of forcing people out of their cars for those folks especially who have no choice but to make their income in doing so. We have clustered intentionally a lot of our social service agencies in the downtown core. And there are many, many of them, and I know there's some folks here tonight who do this, who have to be able to go out and see people in the community and serve them that are homebound. And they have to use their cars to do it. And they have to park downtown to get to their office and to their work. And then they have to go and serve other members of the community. You're making it harder and much more expensive on people who can least afford to pay for it. It's not supporting the larger goals. That's why, obviously, it costs money. So do the police. But we value them and we figure out other means to finance them. The general public doesn't care how we do the, what our accounting system is for parking. They don't care. And frankly, I don't really either. I, I, it's wonderful that we have the fund and that it makes contributions back. I agree it shouldn't. I want to know specifically what's the council action necessary to suspend this administrative action. Is it by motion? You don't have the authority to do that. Okay, well, that's my question. Do we have any, um, do we have any mechanism at all by which we might alter the outcome or the price of parking? No. Um, you can amend your code. I mean, your, your policy making document is in the code. So you Is there no um, manner by which council has, for, I'm gonna use the wrong words here probably, but oh, I'm running out of time. Can I, 
Yep. Up. Mm -hmm. Yep. Just finish? Go ahead and finish, yeah. Okay. When we create an LID, there's an opportunity for the neighbors to remonstrate and say, no, we don't like that. Is there a similar mechanism for council when there's an administrative action to say, we want to review that? Not unless it's specifically included in your code and for parking fees, there's not. For example, for stormwater fees, there's actually a mechanism built into the code that allows for you to kind of pull it up for review by the council. <laughs> Similarly, there's one for airport fees and those are the two that have a code established process to do that. There isn't one in your code for any of the, of the fees. It is just through 2.019, there is a delegated authority to the city manager to adopt those fees. So without any other specific provision to call it up to you, which there isn't for this type of fee. Second round, please, Mayor. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, Claire. Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to ask particularly about, you know, we, we received a number of emails about folks uh, uh, and a couple of counselors referenced this um, who work for Lane Council of Governments, particularly senior and disabled services and said that the block parking permit was being eliminated. <laughs> it wasn't clear to me if that was because of something we were doing, which might be raising the rates or a decision that LCOG had made. And I didn't know if that is something you can shine some light on. Yeah, the bulk permit program is what it's called. And we set it up in the, let's see, when Symant we brought Symantec downtown. It was a essentially a 10, 20, up to 30% discount on permits for large employers downtown that buy more than 25 or 50 permits. They prepay 12 months, and then they, we distribute the permits over the next 12 months. As part of this uh, proposal, we are proposing deleting the bulk permit uh, admin order, uh, process here because our garages are full. We're at capacity. We have waiting lists. The, uh, the use of that tool for an economic development incentive for large employers, we didn't feel was warranted anymore, so we proposed to take it out of the uh, rate structure. Uh, LCOG was or is, they, wa they were through last fall, uh, they purchased the bulk permits and then they resold the monthly permits to their staff downtown. And I've been in a conversation with Brenda Wilson, their executive director, on how to mitigate the impact to their employees. Uh, the Overpark Garage, which we talked about earlier, it's the largest parking garage in downtown. It's the highest used parking garage and it's the busiest and most expensive parking garage downtown. So the 125 LCOG employees, they have a sky bridge to that garage. They're parked right next door to that. So Brenda and I are working through options to try to mitigate the impact to LCOG employees. So you are actively looking for a way to uh, not increase the burden on those senior and disabled service employees in terms of having to bring their cars downtown because I, I think Councilor Clark may be right that they need to use those to go out and do their work. Um, so that was a bit of a rhetorical that, no, question. No, that's, that, that's correct. Uh, uh, Brenda has several ideas in play that would, including more telecommuting options, including the state motor pool. Include, uh, she has a list of options we're working through. We are also looking forward because all of our garages are full. We cannot handle new businesses locating downtown that want parking right now. Giving them that bulk permit. Right, yeah. or in general, uh, right now we have waiting lists on every garage. So if you hired one person and you wanted to park in a garage tomorrow, you're on a waiting list until that position, that place frees up over the next year or two. Great, well that's encouraging because I was very concerned about those emails we were getting. And I, I will say that in years past, it was many years ago now, long before there was an MX with really reliable service, I worked downtown, I did not earn very much money, and I would definitely have to come up with strategies to figure out how to get to my job without driving my car downtown and paying for parking. And using transit was one of those. Uh, parking on the outskirts of the downtown and walking was another one. Uh, right now we've got several park and rides uh, located throughout town where folks can get on the MX or a bus and come downtown. And so folks who don't have to use their car during the day for work, those are actually, actually very viable strategies uh, for folks who are more able-bodied um, to avoid paying a parking fee. So I, I don't... Um, 
believe we are creating a, a huge onerous burden on uh, employees downtown. But there is uh, some cost and there is some effect and we need to be mindful of that. So I'm uh, grateful to hear that there's some work being done um, to try to address that very specific problem for the senior and disabled services employees. Jennifer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Jeff, for answering my questions uh, oh, yeah. via email this last week. I really appreciated that. Um, uh, you mentioned that you're getting a lot of comments, it sounds like, and I'm wondering if any of them <laughs> have made you go back and make any, you're thinking about any adjustments or how, what impact that has had. Uh, thinking the campus uh, campus district, which I think we're going to talk about, uh, that's an area that I'm just thinking about the options that we have out there. The the way that the campus parking district is set up was created in 2010 when the arena came on board, and with different mix of businesses, different uses. So we're kind of uh, working through the ideas and the options that are in the campus area. Oh, that's great because I know you did get some feedback from the campus folks. Yes, we did. It's yep. great to hear that that is having an effect. Um, so you mentioned you had $10 million of deferred maintenance, and then you also mentioned some other programs that you sponsor, I guess. You're not fully paying for them, but I'm wondering how much of your funds go to those programs approximately? Uh, $60,000 this year. 60000 And do you feel like that's a good use of your money? I think part of the value of how do you make parking fun in some ways, right? So you can provide a clean, safe experience in our parking garages. Uh, we can fund the ambassadors, which we have got received feedback that they're part of that fun experience. Uh, the other part is we have brought part of the uh, uh, planning for the downtown core. Parking has played a role in helping that come back. And so in our mind, the uh, event, uh, Holt Center events, the revenue that we receive from that, we put back into the mural program. Uh, the other projects we sponsor more of a, it's a sponsorship, but it's a traffic control plan to shut down the streets for things that happen in the core of downtown. Things that parking knows how to do and we do it well and we help on those ways. So those are sponsorships that bring more people downtown. Oh, that's great, thank you. Um, I also want to say I spend a lot of time in Corvallis and yes, the, you don't have to pay for parking, but I would gladly pay to actually find a spot when I'm driving around Corvallis downtown trying to find a spot, it's horrible. So um, I appreciate we have more access downtown right now in our own city and thank you so much Alan yeah Mike had it right there is no such thing as free parking parking is actually very expensive um, and since it's a uh, all general fund that would fund this and it would be zero sum we could I guess we could cut police and fire in the library to pay for parking but I, I don't think that's a very good choice is there any data Jeff on on the impact of fees for parking in downtown areas on the, on the businesses analysis that you've seen uh, for you know, Eugene or other and uh, or Eugene they're they're all over the place uh, so in terms of the analysis yes every downtown is different we look at Fort Collins compared to Corvallis compared to Salem compared to Springfield Eugene Portland everything is unique what we do know in downtown Eugene is that uh, we have a parking exempt zone, which we encourage lot line to lot line development and the removal of surface lots. We have very narrow streets that encourages um, um, parallel parking on the streets, more pedestrian friendly environment. And then we build garages around the core. And I think the what we seek more is feedback from the downtown businesses about what the rate should be, how to use the money, the investments we make. And so we, we err more on that local community fabric than national studies on, on because they're, they're variable. Right. It was actually the merchants that came to us and said, get rid of this free parking program and reinstall the meters because it didn't work. It ended up being a play parking program. Um, uh, one other point is that um, charging for parking is also consistent with the climate recovery ordinance by encouraging alternative or carbon options. Um, Two questions. One is um, options on the campus parking district. You were you said we we're going to talk about it. Here's your chance. <laughs> what are you know um, the? I think we all received a letter from the West University Business District, and uh, part of that conversation was about the meter time limits. Uh, ir ironically, the 45 minute, 46 minute time limits were set by the business districts in 2010. So we prefer higher times and we'll reach back out to them and yes, we can make that change. 
Uh, some of the questions are around the, you know, charging 6 to 8 p.m. in that district. Uh, we're right there with the district, so we will reach back out to make the needs. Um, part of the, as the arena came on board and the events on campus uh, and the University of Oregon, 20,000 people a day to a very small area, we're trying to figure out how to make sure we create opportunities for people to park and turn over in that area. And so the system that we have in place reflects something, the work we did a while ago, and we need to re-engage that. So we're going, I'll be going back out, having a conversation with them, and trying to figure out what is the right solution for them. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I appreciate the changes that have occurred in the uh, arena parking district, and especially some of the areas that are one hour, because that was, that was right next to the arena. That, that was becoming untenable for a lot of the neighbors. Um, the last question I had relates to, uh, and the one map I really actually wanted to see was wh where the heck are all these residential zones, oh. these permit zones A through J? I know where J is because I live in it, but A is at the bottom. <laughs> A is at the bottom. B and C are on the on the west side here. But on that map, oh, uh, they're all on this in the campus. They're on the most. Some are in the campus district. Correct. Oh, okay. So they're all within this area. Oh, within that map. Okay, thank you. Mayor. Okay, uh, Chris, then Emily, then Greg. Um, thank you. Um, uh, just, uh, I think I've made notes for three quick points. First one, around the question on LCOG, um, Senior and Disability Services. Um, those folks have a huge caseload of folks that are either vulnerable or housebound, and so they may have to get in their cars and travel two or three times a day. So they really need access to their cars. And since their work impacts thousands of other folks in the community, whatever we could do to work out a, an accommodation for them, I think would be extremely important. It's, it's a ripple effect that I think is very significant. And so um, whatever it is you choose to do, I'm perfectly fine with carving out exceptions for, for that group who, who need their cars and who travel frequently to visit vulnerable people. Um, can you remind me again the amount of money that the parking fund transfers into the general fund? Uh, for police services, 838000 Okay. Um, I know we're working on revenue options for public safety, and I know that the, the current $800,000 is, is not accommodated in that thinking, um, but I'm wondering if there's ways we can maybe uh, look at, I'm not talking about the entire internet, that, but ways we can maybe do some, some shaping, some looking at that so we may not have to make quite such a large transfer and, and pick that money up some other way. I don't know what that may, may be right now, but I'm, I'm very willing to look at what we might do, particularly as we craft an entire public safety, community safety package. There may be some flexibility within that. And if we do uh, find some ways to do it, um, we may be able to revisit this, this fee question and maybe we don't have to raise the fees so much or maybe we don't have to do uh, quite what we're talking about doing now. I, I don't know. Um, it's up to you, but I'm just putting planting the idea that if we don't have to make as much of a transfer, maybe we don't have to raise fees as much. Just it's an idea. And then the last question I had was around um, the current parking capacity uh, in, in downtown specifically. Is there a... Uh, uh, a surplus of paid parking spaces. Can people drive to downtown and find a, a parking place downtown with a meter on it relatively easily? It's full. I think the, you know, what I didn't get into is right now the downtown business community and, you know, kind of my fear going forward is that we can't accommodate new businesses downtown. So uh, new companies, new employees, uh, new hires, uh, we are absolutely at capacity in our parking garages for employees. And the, uh, the on street, we have, we have some circulation and turnover on the street. Uh, as we move forward with development from here to the riverfront and to the Fifth Street District Market, uh, it's getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And our wait lists are longer and longer and longer. But in terms of general, uh, let's, let's call it retail parking. Mm -hmm. Are you sensing or do you have any information that would say because we charge for parking downtown, um, it's, it's created a... Uh, um, an excess of spaces. In other words, nobody's parking downtown, so therefore all these um, spaces with parking meters on them are going empty because nobody wants to pay the parking fee. I can't answer that question. What I can answer, uh, we do see people using the meters. They're using it um, much more than they did before 2010 on the street. Uh, one of the garages I look at is the overpark because of the LCOG question, because we're full every day by 9.30, the overpark is full. Uh, which means if employees leave that garage and they come back to park, 
they have nowhere to park in the garage and they come back with that permit. As I look through the data of just one garage downtown, one slice, uh, one of the questions I ask myself is why is this garage so full so fast in the last year? Part of that is just the number of daily and hourly parkers that are parking in our garages. So we have seen a dramatic increase of more people visiting downtown and doing business downtown uh, in our parking structures, taking up some of that demand that we had before for permit spaces. So, so is it possible, and you may not have the answer to this, is it possible that part of the problem we're having downtown is not because it's paid or unpaid, there just isn't enough space? I think it feels like there's not enough space right now. It absolutely does. And as we go through more development downtown, there's not enough space. So if we got rid of the paid parking system, let's say on the streets, that wouldn't necessarily resolve the problem with not enough space. We need to figure out how to move people around. The um, I would just say are... no, that doesn't resolve the issue because uh, you still have the same numbers of people competing for the same numbers of spaces and the and the demand outstrips the supply. And so whether it's paid or not paid, I don't think it resolves the issue. Yeah, and I think that's what I'm trying to get my head around is if I want to take positive steps to solve a problem, is it that it's paid parking or that there's not enough spaces? And it sounds like from a lot of these issues that are going on, we need to be able to provide greater capacity, more mm -hmm. places to park. Mm -hmm. And paying is, a, is not the issue here. Thank you. Okay, uh, we, I have two counselors waiting for their first round. I have two more counselors waiting for a second round. Do I have a motion to extend the meeting by 10 minutes? So moved. Second. second. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, take it away, Emily. Thank you. There's not enough parking downtown. It's too full. You can't have more parking. So it seems to me the obvious thing to do is raise the rates more. John, you're not doing enough. <laughs> We need revenue. I'm serious. You know, we have the CRO. We need less cars downtown. All the spaces are full. There's no places for new spaces. If we raise the rates even more, people will carpool more. People will ride their bikes more. I think, as always, that we should have free buses, and that would make it easier to get downtown. I would love to see a little uh, trolley downtown. Other uh, cities have done it and it's been suggested here in the past. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, so I, I, I grew up long, long, long time ago. We had to put coins in the, in the meter to park. So it's not, you know, alien to me that parking is a service that you do have to pay for. When I go to Portland, which I never do because I have to pay to park there. So I stay home. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Betty and Mike, I would love to have free lots of things, but I think this actually is a place where we're not charging enough because I'm on a team to look for ways to raise money for public safety. And if parking is giving some of the money to public safety, I want it. I want some more. So uh, don't listen to those naysayers, John. I am curious as to why it's $100 a month to park by the library and the train station. The others are like 60 the, so by the library is 1060 Olive. We're leasing a lot from the county. It used to be a former uh, uh, dry cleaner lot. We have a few people that want to purchase a permit there, but we don't want to sell a lot of permits there. And so that's the same way with the train depot. We, those lots are made for daily parking, quick turnover, customer service, uh, but we do have requests once in a while for parking in those locations. Great, let's do more of that. Money, money, money. Uh, where are all the cars going to go? We don't have enough space. Make it more expensive. I know it's backwards, Betty and Mike, but that's where I'm going. Thank you uh, very much, and let's get some free buses, and let's raise some money. Thank you. Okay, Greg. Um, remind me, uh, what the cost to develop a, a new parking space and a parking structure is, what, 65000 to $70,000 per space? Probably on the high end, uh, fifty thousand we could round to. And its surface for is public. about thirty-five thousand yeah, or for so. Yeah, public provision if we build it. And it, 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 it just taking away the 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 backlog and maintenance. How much does it cost the city per year to maintain a parking space? 
Can I do the math real quick? <laughs> <laughs> I know that, uh, so there's different types of maintenance. So if we're just talking about operations, cleaning, sweeping, minor repairs. Uh, Repaving. The, uh, we don't do much of that. That's what part of that is. The, um, uh, our maintenance log is about 1.3 million. We have about 2,500 parking spaces. Hoping someone has a calculator on their phone. I don't have it with me. Is that what it is? 500? 2,500 spaces. How much? 1.3 million. Space per year. So it's a significant amount of money to maintain those, the, those parking spaces. So we, 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 do need to, we do need to charge for parking. The second thing that, um, that, that, that I want to kind of go over to is that with the um, OV development, how many uh, parking spaces are going to be in that development? And are they going to be available to the, to the general public? Or are they going to be reserved for people in that development? I'm not tracking an exact answer, but it is a private development that would the use there would be for the, uh, the customers of that development. It's not a county Wouldn't or city public parking. Open to, Correct. It doesn't mean they won't be there, but it's there to serve the development. What is the long range outlook in terms of um, the need for additional parking balanced against what our goals are with our CRO? And are we looking to uh, develop or add more parking, new parking spaces, other than the one I just mentioned? Or are we looking to do other strategies? Both. The future of parking and transportation with uh, the city of Seattle's parking department changed their name to curbside management because people are not owning cars anymore. They're not driving. They're using Uber and Lyft. They're autonomous vehicles. The financial markets are pricing parking garages as a riskier investment than general public buildings. So the future is uh, unclear right now in our industry. Our strategy in Eugene, where we have our, our CRO, we have a great transportation system, we have a lot of opportunities around here, is to find those other strategies. And that's what we're embarking on this year also, that how do we figure out how to get people downtown, around downtown. Uh, we're working with LTD to do a transit, micro transit in the downtown core. We're working at exterior parking rides. We're trying to find ways that people don't need to drive a solo vehicle downtown to park once and have a park all day. So will we also be looking at um, public-private partnerships with TNCs um, and, the, and the transit district to supplement that? We're looking at a bunch of options. We're open to the options. I haven't explicitly sat down and looked at that option, but we need to figure out a solution. Okay, lightning round for our Over second. 500 bucks a spot. Mike, Mike and then Betty. Thank you, Mayor. I would absolutely be making the motion to alter code to be able to have council have uh, at least some input here as we do with stormwater and those other pieces, except that we don't have near the time to do that. But let's be real clear, at least four of us at this table talked about the importance of altering this plan to compensate for the reasonable need that senior and disabled services have to get in and out of their cars during the course of the day to serve an awful lot of people. And I agree. But here's the point. They're not the only ones. There's an awful lot of people downtown who have a need to get in and out of their cars during the course of a day in order for our downtown to work. This is not a small economic question. And we're not going to solve this today, and we're not going to come up with a good answer, and we're not going to add new code language. But I strongly suggest we have another work session to talk about this in more detail. It affects an awful lot of people. How many How many emails did you get? 125. Uh, this is, did you, you solicited much response, but I'm asking how many did you get that you didn't solicit? I, I don't know. I, I know I got dozens and dozens and dozens from people who were very angry for the same reason. I have to be able to have access to my ability to move around. 
Now, I'm not saying build 20 more parking garages or that we have to, you know, as much as I'd like to make street level parking free. We might get parking garages to charge money. But we need more capacity or we need to allow technology to alter and the difference in the way we manage and live with this for the sake of our own downtown's economic health. I really think this is not a small issue and we ought to talk about it with another work session. Mm -hmm. So I'll put out a poll. Betty. Okay, if you look at what's really successful downtown, the Fifth Street Market area, there's free parking there in three hours, which is a, which is a reasonable amount of time. As for the amount of time, amount of space that is not used, all you have to do is look at Oak Street. There's some other streets too, where there are meters and nobody uses them because there would not be time to park there and get downtown and do what you want to do. So they, they're just meters sitting there. So there's there, that is space that people could be used, be using. Um, as for people always say, well, take MX. Well, a lot of us don't live anywhere near MX. I'd have to go five miles before I could take MX. Um, and they say share rides. The people don't necessarily live near other people who are going where they're going. Once a few years ago, it's been long enough, I don't think anybody could identify the person. It wasn't even the city manager, but... Um, a person, a city employee was pretending he was sharing a ride to get a, a less, to pay less for parking and got caught and had a huge penalty. But everybody can't share rides, everybody can't walk to where they can go, to where, where they can get to a place. And well, I guess that's enough, we're out of, we're out of time, but I, I do think that it's, it's a public service and you just have to look at the places that are succeeding to see that the time to, the time to leave your car is important. Not everybody can take their cars with them every place. So thank you. Um, I think um, I think as the manager introduced this topic as weeds, they're always with us, and the parking conversation will continue to be with us. And so we look forward to the next chapter to discuss some of the things that have been brought up to the table today, and the, and whatever new comes along on the parking landscape. So thank you very much. We're adjourned until 7:30. And when Betty and I agree, it ought to make.